Hali Do, and welcome to Native Chalk Talk, a podcast by Natives for all. Here, we're keeping our Native ancestors' stories and history alive, while also sharing with you our Native culture, traditions, and more. I'm Rachel Youngman, a Choctaw originally from Anadarko, Oklahoma. I hope you'll enjoy this journey with me as we learn from our Native American guests. And I hope you'll do me a favor. Feel free to like and share these episodes. I so appreciate it. Yakuki. Big news, y'all. One of my favorite Choctaw authors, Sarah Elizabeth Sawyer, has a writing course called Fiction Writing American Indians. Now, this course will show you how to discover the insight you need to write quality, authentic stories. You'll also learn practical approaches to researching Native cultures and get answers to hard questions. I'll be taking the same course, and I invite you to take it with me. Just go to AmericanIndians.FictionCourses.com. Dot com. But don't forget to use the code CHOCKTALK, that's C-H-O-C-T-A-L-K, when you go to checkout to get $30 off. Yes, let's do this. In 1820, Choctaw Chief Pushmataha is said to have predicted that some of his listeners would live to see the day when the highly improved Choctaw shall hold office in the councils of that great nation of white people and in the wars with nations of the earth mixed up in the armies of the white man. The fierce war whoops of the Choctaw warrior shall strike terror and melt the hearts of the invading foes. You'll find these words and fascinating stories about the code talkers in the book, The First Code Talkers, written by my guest and professor, researcher, and author, Dr. William Meadows. Listeners, if you haven't checked out episode one of my conversations with Dr. Meadows, take a listen. You'll enjoy it. Today and in the next three episodes, we'll focus on the Choctaw Code Talkers. This is especially exciting for me considering I'm Choctaw. And in the final episode, we'll talk about additional tribes who were Code Talkers. I'd also like to mention in season three, episode three, I did an episode at the First Americans Museum with Nuchi Neshoba, who is a descendant of a Choctaw Code Talker, and Judy Allen, also Choctaw. So check out that episode on Code Talk as well. Okay, let's talk all things Code Talkers, Dr. Meadows. In the previous episode, we discussed the boarding schools preparing many Native American boys for the military due to their militant training and day-to-day -day activities. And the U.S. Armed Forces even recruited at the boarding schools such as Shaloko, Haskell, and Phoenix. 14 Code Talkers even attended Armstrong Academy, um, but then I had the question, why so many from Armstrong, you think, Dr. Meadows? Uh, it's a little bit east of Durant there, as I recall. And um, <clears throat> there is just a heavy uh, Choctaw population concentration down in, in McCurtain and Bryan counties and everything. And they came, um, you know, they actually the Choctaws ranged in age, I think, from about 34 to 17 or somewhere around there. So uh, they weren't all in school at the same time, uh, but had been to that school. But that was just simply one of the principal um, uh, boarding schools for the Choctaw community in that area. OK, and makes and, sense. And boarding schools were targeted. You know, they were uh, mm -hmm. they were really. Um, uh, sought out and recruiters went there because they knew that they had a um, a high you know number of of youth that were about to graduate and everything. So they were always checked out for recruiting in in native communities. Yeah, that that totally makes sense now. And a large number of the Choctaw Code Talkers we'll discuss today were from Southeast Oklahoma and served in the 36th Infantry Division. But the Choctaw weren't originally from Oklahoma. They were removed from Mississippi and other states during the removal to Indian Territory, now Oklahoma. You share in your book that the 36th contained nearly 600 Native Americans speaking 26 languages and dialects, only four or five of which had ever been written. And then you also point out that many of the Native Americans who fought in uh, World War I were older, right? Yes. Yeah. Like I say, uh, they ranged in age, I believe, from thir 34 to about 17. And uh, some had completed schooling years ago and were working, you know, regular normal jobs and things of that nature. 
Um, but of course, when the uh, war started and then very quickly the draft was implemented, uh, a lot of people volunteered. The vast majority just volunteered uh, because they wanted to serve and they wanted to protect their homeland and, and uh, the Choctaw Nation. Uh, but also, you know, uh, secondarily, the United States, you know. Right. And some of those more famous ones were Choctaw Joseph Oklahombi. He was married, Albert Billy, Mitchell Bob, Otis Leader. They were all married with at least one child. And then Ben Carterby, he was married with four children. On the other hand, there was one gentleman who was underage. Tell us about Solomon Lewis. Uh, Solomon Lewis, yeah. Yeah, he's an interesting story because... Uh, <clears throat> Um, nobody really knew, uh, I believe he was orphaned at the time, but nobody really knew his exact age and everything. Hmm. And he was pretty good size for his age and everything. So when he uh, uh, volunteered, nobody, I don't know whether they thought to question it or bothered to question it and everything. Um, but yeah, he actually went in, you know, under age. And, wow. uh, and of course, he wasn't the only one. And, and that happened in both world wars. Uh, there are a lot of soldiers that actually... Um, uh, shall we say, uh, uh, sped up their birth dates, if you will, <laughs> so that they could serve because they, they wanted to go, you know. A lot easier to do back then with their yes. lack of records and automation. <laughs> so yes. Solomon Lewis was born in 1899 and he joined six other Choctaws, including Ben Carterby, Robert Taylor, Calvin Wilson, Pete Maytubby, James Edwards, and Jeff Wilson. So the recruits came together at Fort Sill near Lawton, Oklahoma in the spring and summer of 1917. And by June, there were approximately 300 Native Americans placed in companies H and L, the majority of them being Choctaw, which happened to also include the Armstrong Academy baseball team. So after training, they headed to Camp Bowie in Fort Worth, Texas. And now this was a very diverse group of servicemen, correct? Yeah, yeah, it was very diverse. Um, in the recruitment for this, you know, there were there were natives uh, already in the Oklahoma National Guard prior to World War One, and also non natives, of course, and everything. And uh, Walter Veach is one of the individuals that specifically was asked to help recruit uh, members for these companies down around uh, Durant and Antlers and this this general area there. And so he was already in the National Guard, familiar with service, et cetera, and helped do that. And so, yeah, the majority of the people, uh, particularly from a Native perspective, in these units are going to be drawn out of primarily eastern Oklahoma and southeastern Oklahoma. Uh, so there are very large numbers of Cherokee, uh, of Choctaw, um, some Chickasaws, and then smaller numbers of other groups, even, even Poncas, Osages, uh, Peorias, uh, so forth and so on. Uh, so members of a lot of different groups. And then, of course, there were a number of non-Indian Oklahomans uh, that were from a, a vast variety of of, uh, of backgrounds, some of them as uh, immigrants and some of them as the first generation born here of immigrants and everything. So, yes, it was a very, uh, very mixed group. And then eventually, when they get made into the um, 142nd Infantry Regiment, uh, Company E, uh, initially will be almost all native with the exception mm. of a few officers. And uh, so this high numbers, a lot of people ask sometimes, why is there such a concentration? Well, if you look at the demography of who's in particularly Southeast Oklahoma, it's very heavily native populated. So of course you're going yeah. to draw <laughs> large, large numbers from that. So it's not a, uh, uh, not a fluke or anything. And of course the army wanted to, uh, their plan actually was to not have intentionally all native groups. There were requests for that by both natives and non-natives. Um, and the idea, of course, was still assimilation at the time. So in most of the parts of the country, natives were, were really dispersed or sprinkled around in larger units. But here, just the demographic features produced some companies with heavily, heavily uh, native uh, membership. Interesting. And for them to all come together like Choctaws a lot of time stayed amongst the Choctaws or maybe maybe neighboring um, tribes that had come over to Oklahoma, such as the Chickasaws, for instance. But it must have been really cool to be 
um, fighting with your fellow natives out there. As you mentioned, Company H and L combined to form Company E, 142nd Infantry, and then this group. Um, there consisted 89 Choctaws, 68 Cherokees. So I was also reading in your book that some were determined to be deficient in English. Why? Why is that? Uh, I'm I'm not I'm not sure. I'd have to read that passage again. Um, there might, you know, there might have been some that just didn't want to be, um, shall we say, imposed upon or drawn into other things because of that. I don't really know at this point and everything. Yeah, um, no worries. But what was their, you know, what was their cultural comfort level about taking on this other language or or deciding not to and everything um right. i have no doubt though that just just the experience alone uh many individuals would have had to have picked up and learned some english uh, those that mm -hmm. stayed in there, just from the, again the the constant presence of being around a lot of non-natives and, and things of that nature you know right you know, there's a there's there's a, always a discussion about Joseph Oklahoma, how fluent he was, and there's there's some um, some statements say that he was he you know he was illiterate, he could not read or write or anything, uh, but yet there's other emphasis uh, where he um, his family describes him reading uh, hymnals and and singing and mm -hmm. things on the porch. So now, were those wrote in Choctaw or in Eng English? I don't know. Um, but he was interviewed in like 1937, and the transcript of it is, uh, yes, it, it is somewhat uh, partially broken English, if you will, uh, but it's, it's, it's understandable. There's no real problem in understanding him. So I'm sure he picked up, you know, as well, uh, English as he went along. Hmm. And then they were also taught French, too, right? Yes, yes, there was some instruction in uh, basic things in fr in French because that's where they were going to be fighting. And of course, uh, you are going to encounter uh, civilian people, but also French troops. Uh, the 36th was actually fighting under the French while they were there, so they were assigned under under them. And uh, there would that would have been a very practical skill to be able to communicate with your uh, your French uh, comrades. Then you come back to Oklahoma after the war and you're able to speak some English and French. <laughs> yeah, well, quite likely, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. look and, at and me, I'm know, so fancy. I, of course, I mean, Choctaw people would understand this, um, but for a lot of outsiders, you know, um, even today, there are areas of Southeast Oklahoma that are fairly rural and, and you know, yeah. fairly isolated and remote. And so if we go back, you know, a little over a hundred years ago, well, um, you know, even the interstates and the big highways weren't in the end yet, you know. So, yeah, mm -hmm. this was a fairly remote, uh, um, you know, closed off area and everything. And Choctaw would have been the normal common lingua, you know, that, that would have right? been spoken. Oh, totally. Everyone was immersed in their community. So, yeah. and, um, you know, hardly, hardly, you know, no radio, no TV, um, right. very little of that kind of outside exposure that we're inundated with today. Some also played sports while in the boarding schools, which came in handy. Tell us about that. Yeah, sports was uh, sports was a normal part of uh, any school setting, uh, but in boarding schools, uh, you know, football, track and field, those types of things were very, very popular. Baseball, et cetera, and everything, and athletics was was just a standard part of uh, what you uh, quote unquote a young man should be doing in these school systems and everything. So yeah, there are actually uh, several. Uh, uh, I believe Harold Masid, if I remember, was a uh, had played some college football and things. And so there are some that were, um, you know, had, had external experience on college teams in addition to boarding school or local high schools. And so sports was very popular and, and that followed them into, uh, um, you know, into service. And I don't know how much uh, stickball was being played back then, uh, mm -hmm. but I bet some of these men were active in that in the home setting as well. So athletics would have been a, a pretty familiar aspect as well as you know many people had to walk back then you know and mm, so people right. were people were much more physically active than today and um so i'm you know all this would have added up to uh people with some uh physical stamina and ability you know yeah for sure and and you mentioned harold moss seat 
Um, he was declared the greatest tackle in the American Expeditionary Forces, the AEF, by his comrades. And then also, having coached football for years, Chaplain Charles H. Barnes organized football teams in the regiment. The 142nd won game after game until losing division championship to the 111th Engineers. And the 142nd also formed a seven-man all-Native American basketball team, winning 20 of their first 21 games, and they soon became the regimental team. But what some people may not know is that the 36 consisting of Native Americans had land allotments. So they were individual landowners, some of them possessing considerable oil holdings, which meant what? Uh, yeah, this is a, a really interesting aspect following the Dawes Act and, and some similar acts with this, um, the process of allotment again to divide up the reservations, reduce the land base of the Native holdings. And again, the idea, it was structured towards assimilation. You would be um, you would be flooded or kind of sprinkled around with lots of uh, non-native neighbors. And the intention was, again, to assimilate, to give you models of otherness to, uh, to emulate. Um, so individuals typically received, uh, I think in your area, usually about 160 acres uh, per person. Mm -hmm. uh, but also sometimes you might have relatives that had passed on or uh, those situations where you inherited more than one parcel of land. And so that land a lot of times was rented for agriculture or you know different, different activities of that. And so yes, there are individuals um, in the company. Um, some of them are not very well off at all, uh, but there are some that have considerable land holdings and even some that have oil. And so one of the nicknames uh, for the company became the Millionaire Company because there were, <laughs> I don't know if technically any of them were actually millionaires, but there were some that were really quite well off um, and also um, had, dre you know, their dress and their vehicles and things were very, um, you know, fashionable at the time, you know, for some of those, particularly some groups like up in the Osage area and up in, up in this area. Oh, for sure. So, yeah, uh, there, there, is, uh, there is a whole different land tenure situation here, you know, with the native situation. And so, yes, some of these individuals would have been receiving um, lease monies, per capita, perhaps oil checks coming in. And those are mentioned sometimes in the uh, in the unit reports and things. That's fascinating. Yeah. So what people probably that were non-native in the service didn't expect was that here come these well-educated, some of them wealthy Native Americans who also just brushed it in sports <laughs> and also in the military. So uh, I bet, I bet it was um, a good day for natives to actually be seen as, as um, what they had not been previously seen as. So there was a surprisingly a lot of praise the native American soldiers received in the press. I say surprised because we all know our native American people were looked down upon for so long. So praise for physical endurance, rapid learning, exuberance, exhibiting so much spirit that the officers find difficulty holding them in check, in quotes. The Indian is the best light infantry soldier in the world, was another quote. Um, we talked about Solomon Lewis earlier. Tell us more about his story. Um, well, one of the unique things was that he, uh, he had met a girl at some of the local football games. And uh, he, uh, uh, you know, had, like I say, he was pretty much raised in the school because he was orphaned and everything. And so she actually came down, I believe it was Mary Patterson um, at, at Southeast College, um, Southeastern Oklahoma at that time. And anyway, actually came down and they were married before he went overseas and everything. Okay. So that was kind of one of the really uh, unique stories and everything of that nature. Um, yeah, but yeah, he he was an orphan. He had no military uh, insurance beneficiary. And that was one of the things was he asked her if he could name her as a beneficiary. And, and uh, that worked out, you know, before he went overseas, you know. Yeah, what a what a love story. Um, yeah. There was a superintendent you mentioned in the book, Gabe Parker, who was Choctaw, who mm -hmm. encouraged Native Americans to sign up for soldiers insurance. Good thing they did, uh, which. Mm -hmm most did for $5,000 and $10,000 uh, benefits. Interestingly enough too, Patterson was also an orphan living with her aunt when she met Lewis. So 
He wanted to make her his beneficiary. She came to meet him at the training camp at Fort Worth and they married in November of 1917. I just, I just like them. Um, I recall Judy Allen saying that they had a wonderful long marriage and a happy life together. And then the time came when the 36 were told they'd have to leave for Europe. So on April 11th, 1918, what was described as the greatest crowd in Texas history gathered in Fort Worth. Among those present were the governors of Texas and Oklahoma. Your book states, again, it was the site of Captain Walt Walter Veach and his purely Oklahoma company of Indian boys that made the massive ranks of fathers and mothers and brothers and sweethearts tear their lungs out with cheering. The 142nd set up for training in France and what did that training look like? Yeah, this is another aspect that, that sometimes is not realized is that um, the 36, once they went over there, they actually went through several months of training and uh, exercises and things and really would not go into uh, combat until September and everything. So they spent mm. most of the summer. So there was a lot of pre-combat training and everything. Uh, one of the things that they worked upon was tactics. And so going out in the field, practicing tactics. And one of the things that uh, one of the officers mentions in his uh, memoirs is that uh, the native soldiers uh, were reacting to the, the um, terrain in front of them differently than the non-Indian soldiers. And they were picking up on advantages for uh, defilades and things like that to use uh, crevices for cover and, you know, ways to approach a, uh, target with more protection of cover. So the 36 caught on to that and discussed it with them. They actually ended up adjusting some of their techniques or tactics to follow the native model of what these, these gentlemen were offering and everything. And, you know, how much of that came from just growing up in a rural area, hunting and fishing, or, you know, maybe huh, it's not right. it had been passed down, uh, you know, hard to say but they clearly were more adept at using cover and that really caught the attention of the officers, you know? And so right. I think there's a, there's a good area of where, yeah, the native actually influenced, at least in this unit, influenced the strategy, you know? Of the yeah. Army. So they actually influenced the strategy. That's interesting. You know, it's like, we're stepping up the game. <laughs> yeah. And, and of course there is a lot, uh, there's a tremendous amount of, of, uh, of praise and recognition. And this is always one of the most interesting, you know, subjects, I think, when, when, when uh, public crowds or students ask and everything. And, and uh, the officers are, they're commenting about, you know, whatever you ask the native soldiers to do, they just do it. Uh, they mm -hmm. don't try and walk their way out of it. They don't argue with it. It's just, they take it and, and snap, they get it and everything. Um, right. They talk about, uh, so there's not not much venting about it, you know. Uh, they talk about where they take a lot of the physical things, and you know, it's it's light work for them, you know, pretty much. And mm -hmm. do it. Uh, they pick up on certain abilities that, uh, again, it's a fine line between complimenting and perhaps stereotyping um, about natural abilities and things. Uh, sure. Believing that natives have natural biological abilities to do all these kind of martial activities. Um, again, I, I think um, some of it is um, basically coming from a rural area and having done a lot of these things, hunting and fished and walked long distances. And you know, as well as I do, Choctaw country is really mountainous. <laughs> so yeah. I'm sure, I'm sure they climbed a lot of land down there, cutting across ridges and things of that yes. nature. Um and we're fairly accustomed to it, you know, and everything. Um, the, 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 um, I think the important part of this is that there is a danger to this, what Tom Holm calls the Indian Scout Syndrome, is that when you start personifying these troops as, as military superman and everything, mm -hmm. um, then they can, get, they can get an unduly or disproportionately assignment to more dangerous positions like scouts and snipers and uh, patrol leaders, reconnaissance. And that means you're going to have a higher percentage of contact with the enemy and therefore more casualties. And that's exactly what happens in World War I. So wow. um, while there is, you know, I think while it's clearly intended as positive praise and things like that, 
um, it can have a little uh, a little bit of a dangerous aspect to the over stereotyping, you know. Oh yeah, totally. Yeah. It's like I, th I think a lot of it is, you know, it, it's it's in the, um, you know, it's the culture makeup and the attitude towards things, and and I see that even today. Um, sometimes when I take students down to Indian country, the thing things that they start complaining about and everything is, uh, you know, and I grew up in the country and, and we're like, are you kidding me? You know, um, and like, do you Same. see anybody down here? Yeah. Do you see anybody down here complaining about it? You know, no. And right. you just roll with it, you know, and it's uh, so true. It's so true. So, you know, a lot of these, and there, there are a lot of these guys that hunted and fished and had some, you know, had some, pra you know, very practical, had done logging and things like that. And right. very hard work practical skills and and there are elements of that that would would transfer over to your training and and uh not seem as much of a challenge you know perhaps so oh yeah so captain veach was eventually replaced by elijah w horner and there mm -hmm. was a crucial time during the closing days of World War One, September 26th through November 11th, 1918, when it comes to how our code talkers came into play. So what was it that was happening during that time? Um, so as the summer went along, uh, summer of 1918, and training intensified and continued, there was a more or less kind of like an inventory of the units. And uh, not only Captain Veach, who, like I say, he was around, I believe he was almost 40 at this time or right at 40. There's a whole number of older officers who are basically called out uh, of the units and they are sent back to some other training assignments and then some of them are actually discharged. And so like Captain Veach was actually, I think he was discharged around October 10th or so. Um, so he was not with them when they actually went into combat. And that's nothing, nothing against him personally. That's just the way yeah, the military system works. But yeah. there's a whole series of officers like that that were older uh, that were called out. So um, when we get into the uh, uh, beginning of the combat and everything, uh, the company commander does get uh, killed. And then um, Elijah Horner, who is the, the uh, lieutenant, is bumped up to the company commander. And so the, the Choctaw and Company E and, and 142nd here, they are primarily involved in two major battles in World War I and then a series of, of, of cleanup actions and, and uh, patrolling in between. So the first, of course, is taking uh, St. Etienne in that fight. And then there's a progression towards the Iron River and the area that will become known as Forest, Forest Farm. And they're doing a lot of cleanup, catching small pockets of Germans, but the Germans are on a, a pretty heavy retreat, and they have crossed the river at the Ain, with the exception of this very uh, pronounced peninsula, uh, or horseshoe, if you will. And why it's so valuable is it's, it's a very, very elevated position. So uh, I'm not sure the exact elevation, but I'm going to say easily 40 or 50 feet. So they have a great view. The Germans remaining in this position have a command view of anything approaching them, but also to their sides. And so you, the Americans cannot get past this until they take this point out because the Germans on that point can easily call in artillery or fire or whatever, even to their flanks. Mm -hmm. And so the French are ordered twice to take this position and they are repelled with heavy losses. So then the 36th are brought up and uh, particularly the 142nd and 141st and are ordered to now take this position. Well, as they had, as they were beginning to approach this and the Germans were retreating, they were finding more and more German phone lines left behind, but still running. In other words, still active and right. not disassembled or, 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 or uh, scuttled or anything of that nature. So the Americans reasoned, and I think soundly, of course, but, um, but the Germans had done this on purpose. Uh, hoping they will simply use those already established lines and it'll be even easier to tap into them, you know, mm -hmm. and get them. And so uh, the order, you know, comes down knowing that the Germans, uh, uh, they have the ability to to tap in and, and over listen and break codes anyway. 
They're very good linguists. So the idea actually comes down in, in an order um, from the um, uh, battalion and division, or I'm sorry, the battalion and the uh, uh, companies uh, down to this idea of, you know, uh, Captain Horner is asked, do you have, you know, eight um, Indian men who are both, you know, fluent in their language, but also good in English, you know, and okay. he says, yeah, you know, no problem. Wow. No problem. And that's, I got it. <laughs> that's going to be the first time. And he selects the eight and um, then they are deployed in strategic positions. The messages are sent out in Choctaw. And when they, their plan, when they advance and actually attack uh, Forest Firm, it's with complete surprise and they rout them. We'll be back after this quick break. Are you looking for the perfect gift for your significant other, your bestie, or even yourself? You know you're worth it. Luxury soaps, lotions, and lip balms from Baker's Bar Soapery are 100% Choctaw crafted, and they make the perfect gifts. This work of art is their signature turquoise soap, and it's made to look like Sleeping Beauty turquoise. Do you see this gold veining throughout? and the gold marbling on top. Love it. Next, check out this Apple Mint custom fragrance oil soap called Say Their Name. And all proceeds go to the missing murdered indigenous women Chutta cause. You'll only find this blend made specifically for this soap. And yes, these are made with goat's milk, which leaves your skin feeling soft and supple. So load up on these Choctaw soaps made by Tiffany at Baker's Bar Soapery at thebbsoapery.com. But be sure to get 20% off when you use the code Native Chalk Talk, that's all caps, when you spend $25 or more. Treat yourself to the luxury your skin deserves with Baker's Bar Soapery. September 11th through 12th, the 36th Division took more than 12,000 German prisoners. And then after that, the AEF creates a 47-day Allied offensive called the Meuse Argonne Campaign, which took place among 60 miles of Western Front. And then the Meuse Argonne was the largest, most costly and bloodiest battle of the AEF in U.S. military history, resulting in over 187,000 Allied casualties and losses, including 117,000 Americans. This campaign was credited for leading directly to the armistice. And again, all of this is in Dr. Meadows' book. During this campaign in October of 1918, the 36th was called in to take the village of St. Anne and then push forward. And it was during this time that a famous Choctaw code talker named Joseph Oklahoma and others in Company D would perform a notable feat. But we'll talk about that more in the next episode. This battle was costly, with seven officers and 182 enlisted men killed and 382 wounded. However, they did hold their position. But something in particular was impacting the success of this mission, correct? Yes, yeah. Um, the 36th really did not have adequate maps of the terrain mm. that they're trying to take. And, and so there's a, there's a, um, a cartography uh, shortage, if you will, on that hand. And then they were also, again, and this was happening all up and down the line, not just with the 36th, uh, but the Americans were becoming increasingly aware that the Germans were able to intercept messages, uh, break codes, tap into lines, etc. And there, there's actually several different, um, uh, several different situations here. One, most of your communication at this time is by telephone. Uh, ra radios do exist, but they they have a very short distance, and they're they're not as uh, as useful as they will be later. So, with a telephone line, um, a physical line, anywhere between point A and point B, so like two companies, any German can get up to that line at any point if they can get there and clip into it. And then it's just mm -hmm. like a party line. Just listen to the conversation all day long. Right. Uh, they, they also had uh, a type of listening device, which works basically um, the technology of it's kind of like a magnetic coil. And it can sit at quite a distance, even sometimes up to four kilometers or more. And it can magnetically pull uh, a transmission, that wave, and catch it. And so then all you have to do, again, is listen with headphones and, or, 
you know, that kind of thing to monitor the messages. So with the listening devices, you don't even have to be that close to the front. Um, yeah. The, the third thing was we had a, a device called a buzzer phone. Um, it worked on lights and sounds. It's a way of coding your message and then sending it. But it's very time consuming. It's slow mm. uh, to, to do the coding, to then let it do its, its thing and then decode it. The fourth way of sending messages was a runner. And so physically hand a runner off a written message or a verbal message. And then the minute they pop up out of the trenches and take off, well, they're a target for snipers. Uh, they're Terrifying. A target for, yeah, machine gun fire and anything else that could, that could be heaved at you. But that was the two main uh, things, the small arms fire. And so one in four of the runners are either getting shot uh, or captured. So your message is not going through in either situation. And a lot of times your message is actually getting um, captured as well. And so it's just not an efficient, uh, efficient no. way to send mm -hmm. messages securely. And it creates the need is you need something faster and you need something secure. Yeah, totally. That, I mean, that, that's the situation they're facing right after uh, they enter combat. Yes, yeah, serious impacts. Like you said, the high casualties associated with men attempting to lay and repair communication lines, the tapping of those lines, the high casualty rate of runners carrying messages from one location to another. I would not want to be any of these people. They are heroes, truly. So your book reads, as Major General Greeley described, beyond doubt, the enemy's listening in experts acquired definite and important information as to our plans and movements. When all other methods failed, runners were used, generally under conditions of greatest hazard and in the midst of vigorous fighting. One source reports, they were also capturing about one messenger out of four who served as runners between the various companies on the battle line. Again, terrifying. And, you know, telephone was the most, uh, most useful, but it was not secure. Mm -hmm. And because you could run, you could run, run phone lines back to every element from, from companies uh, to a battalion, uh, from battalions back to regiments, from regiments back to division. So it was very, very practical and uh, fairly uh, stable source, but, not if it could get tapped into. And then, True. of course, you also had the situation of artillery, uh, artillery constantly knocking out phone lines. And yeah. uh, whether, you, whether a phone line was on the surface or even if you buried them, uh, an artillery shell, a lot of them, would the explosions were so deep and so large, it could sever your phone anyway. And then someone would have to get out there and splice it. So that was another, another dangerous situation. Indeed. Oh, yeah. so in your book, you mention Greeley described some of the dangers experienced by Signal Corps troops. Some perished through flares of star rockets, which brought on a shower of machine gun bullets or the deadly barrage, generally German, but at times American. Mm -hmm. Others, when wounded, met a lingering death by thirst or starvation in the labyrinth of shell holes and other craters, while some were killed outright as they sought entrance through or exit from the gaps in the enemy's wire entanglement. General William R. Smith had suspected the Germans were monitoring their communications, so he devised a plan. Tell me about that. Uh, yeah, it became pretty clear this was happening in, in other units as well. Um, we don't know if all these units were comparing notes and everything, but he devised a plan where basically um, a false order would be given at a certain time. And oh. so people were, were pre-warned, uh, I'm sure by, by foot, by in-person communication, that this message will be a dud, uh, just act like it's a normal message, pass it on, but do not react to it and everything. And so... Uh, a certain hill was selected. There was an order of a certain amount of troops and supplies and support and everything to uh, relocate to this hill. They gave the designations, of course, uh, map coordinates and everything, and to be ready to, um, you know, commence firing and everything at this given hour. Well, basically a couple minutes after that hour comes to fruition, the Germans just decimate that hill with everything they've oh. got artillery-wise, but there's nobody up there to receive it. 
but this was the confirmation that they were hearing everything that was being transmitted and hence they're able to react to it immediately as quick as a phone call you know right and so that oh is the God. way of kind of double checking and proving that yes we do not have secure uh communications in this setting so listeners i assume you see what we're getting at here like there's a need for something different but in the meantime sometimes the germans would even leave their lines up on purpose after leaving right yes yeah as a uh you know most of world war one was it stalled out very quickly and become a a trench kind of warfare with very little gains and you know uh, back and forth in these heavily decimated areas but as the summer of of uh, 1918 come around um, and of course the American troops bolstered what uh, France and England and Belgium and other countries, you know, Australia and everybody had supplied, um, they begin to gain ground more quickly and they begin to force the Germans back in, into a retreat. So ground, some ground was being covered very, very quickly in short amounts of time. So it become a more fluid open war. And that's where the Americans are really going to come into and uh, and do uh, the majority of their part. But yes, they were leaving phone, uh, running phones as well as active lines. Um, and again, the belief is hoping they would just simply use them, you know. Right. And so it's not hard when you pick up a phone. You can tell whether it's a live line or not or whether it's a dead line, you know. Yeah, they're like, go ahead and we'll be into, able to tap into what you're using by yeah. using our old equipment that we're leaving there for you on purpose. So interesting. The next mission would be to take on Forrest Firm. And with the knowledge that the Germans were listening in, they needed a plan for secured communication. If you haven't guessed it yet, y'all, this solution would come from the Choctaws in Company E, 142nd Infantry Regiment. And it would come just 15 days before the end of World War I. So listeners, you know how Dr. Meadows just shared that the Germans would abandon but leave their lines intact in hopes that they would just tap into the American communications. Well, what came next was fabulous. Tell us what happened, Dr. Meadows. Uh, so Alfred A. Bloor is, uh, Colonel Bloor, um, is the um, uh, regimental commander and everything. And um it's, it's really not clear to this day where the exact order uh, came from, but the closest clue we have is, so after the French have tried twice to take Forrest Firm and have been re repelled with heavy losses, like I said, the 36 is brought up here, um, in one of the writings that um, uh, um, Captain Horner left behind, A.E. Horner, um, or E.W. Horner, sorry. Uh, he states that a call came down from the battalion signal command to him. And the call was, do you have eight, you know, natives who can speak well in both languages? And do we have that? And he said, yeah, I can, I can pick some out. We have plenty of those. There's plenty of them that are well-educated, etc." And so then he picks the eight men and then they are deployed and used. Now, we don't know exactly who came up with the idea. There's a lot of references, but the documents do not really specify if it was Colonel Bloor, if it was somebody from the uh, Signal Battalion Command, et cetera, and everything. But the command mm -hmm. came down from higher up uh, with the specific request of getting um, eight young Native guys. Woohoo! And so it begins. And utilizing their language to be able to send codes back and forth that the Germans could never intercept properly, this truly remedied the issues that they had in saint Etienne of the Germans tapping into the transmissions. By the way, there's so much good information in this book, listeners, that we just don't have time to cover here, such as Dr. Meadows going into the history of transmitting info through Morse code and telegraph and wiretapping and electromagnetic interception that took place during the war. It's fascinating. So listeners, be sure to grab the book so you get all that inside scoop. All right, so they're off to take Forced Firm, and on October 26th, it was time to test the use of the Choctaw language. And did it work? Yes. Uh, 
without a flaw. <laughs> um, so, um, so the idea now is that we will use, we'll just go ahead and use telephones. Uh, we have these uh, eight Choctaw radio, you know, going to be on radios at different posts. Again, the records do not specify what the spacing was, um, but I'm going to guess it would, it would have been very practical if they would have been by different companies. Yeah, uh, a, a person at each company command post because that that's your most front central communication point. Um, there are also, and there's only a couple references in the records, but there were also some Cherokees used in the exact same uh, conflict. We don't know exactly okay. how many, mm -hmm. but we know they're at we're out of the same company in the same time. So uh, the most information we have though is on on the Choctaws. So there are. Uh, scouts, which are are basically told to kind of creep and uh, and belly crawl up uh, certain ravines and crevices and use cover and get as close to the German lines as they can without being detected. And they actually stay there most of the day just listening and observing to get information. Um, they come back, report what they've got. The messages go out in Choctaw basically for a prepared attack. It specifies the time, exactly how it's going to be done, etc. So the plan is um, at, I believe, let's see here, I want to say it was something like 4.20 in the afternoon, but um, they start a artillery barrage. And the artillery is all um, unified to where they will all start hitting on a parallel line at the exact same time say 420 in okay. three minute mm -hmm. increments uh the artillery moves ahead slowly so many meters and but they're all still in sync with each other so think of like a ruler being put down across a piece of paper and then another ruler and then another ruler it's a creeping rolling barrage well yeah. what that yeah. forces you to do is it's such concentrated heavy artillery you cannot survive that unless you get underground. So it forces the Germans into their trenches, uh, down into their dugouts, which are these large underground uh, quarters, uh, cavernous quarters. The troops of the 100, uh, particularly the 141st, 142nd, they are ordered to, as soon as that barrage begins, to get up out of their lines, to go over the top, basically, and then to, to go at a pretty pick quick pace and to get right behind that barrage and follow it. Now that's dangerous because a, sh a shell that's short or faulty mm -hmm. will take out mm -hmm. you, you know, right, uh, but right. they're, ru they're, they're basically rushing, following as close as possible behind this barrage. When the barrage finally lifts at the last, at the last line and the last moment, then the troops are already on top of the German position. They rush it. And in a matter of minutes, uh, take it. Um, approximately there were 500 or so Germans in that position, uh, around half or a little more were killed in fighting. The other half simply surrendered. Um, many people were, were caught off guard. They were still down in their, uh, holes, et cetera, and everything and not prepared that they would actually be rushed that quickly. Mm -hmm. Now to compare the two differences, um, at St. Etienne, we gave the casualty figures a while ago, and I think it was 182 men killed or something. At Forest Firm, only 14 U.S. soldiers were killed. Wow. And a couple of those were actually killed by a short shell, a faulty firing a shell. Um, so there was very little loss of life, not to minimize those, but very little loss of life with the use of the Choctaw. And this is proof positive of the value of using the native languages for this because they knew the Germans could hear it, they're monitoring it, but they have no idea what they're facing and no way to break it. So right. that, that, that is the turning tide in this, um, in this fight. Now it's, it's, it's one, it, it's valuable. It's one small element of the much bigger war, but it's valuable. I believe because it shows the practicality of using these languages. They, they go ahead later that night and continue. We have another document where it shows where they continued to do messages in Choctaw 
uh, even things re regarding the uh, evacuation of wounded, the reports of casualties and things of that nature, because again, that's information you do not want the enemy to know. Uh, tactical, uh -huh. you know, get, shows weaknesses and things of that nature. Uh, but yes, we do have some evidence they went ahead and used it then uh, that evening and likely into the next day. Interesting. And about the actual language itself, while some English terms had Choctaw equivalents, others did not. Bloor wrote a report and some terms were quickly developed. Grenade became stone, regiment became tribe, casualties became scalps. And the Choctaws created specialized coded vocabulary to be mixed into the Choctaw language. Um, and then, so you were also saying something in the book about it being basically a form of double code, right? Mm -hmm. What does that that's, mean? That's the way I would describe it. So um, to, to kind of ballpark the whole, the whole idea of code talking, um, okay, you're using a language that let's say from the German perspective, right, is basically an obscure, unknown language. Uh, even in America, I bet you could have lined up most Americans outside of Southeast Oklahoma, and they would not be able to identify Choctaw. They, right. you know, they'd say, well, you know, it's an Indian language or something, but I have no idea what it is. Right. So it's not, not a well-known uh, language in that sense. Um, it was not a very... Um, published or written language. Now, Choctaw did have writing well back into the early 1800s. And by this time, uh, yes, there are things printed in Choctaw, but it's mostly for local consumption. So it's Bibles, uh, it's hymn books, it's things for the local community. Uh, it's not um, history books, it's not best-selling novels, it's not things that are going to really have a market or be sold outside the Choctaw community. It's clearly not the kinds of things that other countries would have in their national libraries and things. So that made it even more obscure, you know, in that sense. Yeah, right. Um, it's a full language, right, which all of these languages are. It's a full language. So then you've got to deal with, well, a different syntax, a different word order sometimes. Um, there's a lot of native languages where kind of one long agglutinated expression ends up being, you know, 10 or 12 words in English. And right. so running that, running that together is not going to be as easy for someone else to understand. Um, it's not based on mathematical principles like codes and ciphers where you're assigning meaning to something or just shifting the rotation of it, you know. Um, and so you, you take those different things together that makes it very hard for the Germans to even know what they're hearing, identify it, and then how would you break this? Now, when they form the code words, which will they, they will do right after Forest Firm, then this special coded vocabulary inserted into the everyday normal Choctaw language, uh, then it becomes these are terms that only these men know. So it is kind of a code within a unknown language, a code within a code. So now we've yeah. learned a bit about the form of communications as well as things like double code. And um, we're learning more um, than some people would possibly learn about World War One just from their regular history studies in school. But the last combat occurred at Forest Firm on October 27th. And then less than two weeks later, the armistice was signed on November 11th, ending the war to end all wars. So the brigade containing the Choctaw Code Talkers had borne the brunt of the fighting and suffered the most casualties. And um, the 36 was also credited with capturing three heavy pieces of artillery, six pieces of light artillery, four howitzers, 17 trench mortars, 277 machine guns, large quantities of small arms, and 813 German prisoners of war. Now, the the Choctaws actually had helped come up with um, a more formal use of their language to be used in future fighting, but they ended up not really using this language. Why so? Okay, so uh, immediately following uh, Force Firm, so October 26th to 28th, uh, they were relieved, and then they were marched back uh, a few days to a rest camp uh, for, for, you know, recuperation and rest and everything of this nature. 
As soon as they got there, there was an order that came down. Again, we don't we don't really have who instigated it or or implemented it, uh, but the order was uh, to a lieutenant Temple Black, who okay. is a Cheyenne from Oklahoma, and there that that's a family out around Watonga, the Black family. Okay. Um, he was a lieutenant in the 42nd, um, 142nd. He is ordered to recruit 18 men now and hmm. three non-commissioned officers and to do a week of training. The training will focus on practicing sending messages in Choctaw, but with a bigger group of men now, and developing code words for things that they have trouble getting across in existing Choctaw. So modern things like grenades, right, hmm. or different units of soldiers or things like gas, poison gas, which was widely used in, in World War I. So there is, uh, again, the documents are a little vague. It says one week of training now, whether that's five or seven days, you know, it's not perfectly clear. But uh, we have a list of the terms that... Um, um, Major Morrissey left, who was in, in charge of the Signal Battalion. Um, to the best of his memory, the terms that they wrote, and there was about, I think, about 16 terms or so that he recalled. And he did this just very shortly after the war ended and everything. Mm -hmm. uh, they finished the training on November 10th, 1918. Their next deployment would have been towards the uh, forces moving towards the town of Metz. So that would have been the next engagement. But the very next day, the armistice was signed. And so, mm -hmm. yes, they created these code terms, but they didn't actually get to use the code terms um, in World War I. Now, the gotcha. real important thing, I think, though, is that by doing that, we, we do not know if other tribes compose similar lists of terms. There's just no records. But Basing on what we have on the Choctaw, they set the template, they set the the uh, the mold, if you will, for what will be expanded upon in World War II, when the Comanche, the Chippewa, and Oneida, uh, the Hopi, the Meskwaki, and the Navajo, they do have formal training and do create lists, extensive lists of code terms, and it all goes back to, as far as we know the Choctaw doing it this right at the end of the war. Ah, interesting. I didn't realize that they had kind of set the tone for what would come later in uh, World War II. Because it's the, the Choctaw records, and it's interesting how we end up with the records. The record, most of the records were not really the normal military records that they recorded for historical purposes or this kind of thing. It was right after the war ended a gentleman named Lieutenant John Eddy, who had been the superintendent at Crow Indian Reservation. He was mm -hmm. gassed late in the war. And as he was recuperating, they were looking for something him to do that was kind of light duty. And yeah. he had the idea, b being familiar at least with the Crow, you know, and, and a little bit about Native culture, he had the idea that he would like to conduct a historical survey of the experiences of Native Americans in World War I. So he got approval to do that. And he sent out requests to all kinds of different units asking with this survey of questions. Well, uh, several, several answers were returned from the 36. Colonel Bloor wrote up a very detailed account of exactly how they used them at Forest Firm. Um, Major, um, um, the signal battalion, Major Morrissey, he wrote an account of what the actual code terms were that they formed and what the translations were and things. And the reason we have the better documentation on the Choctaw, a lot of it is because of Lieutenant Eddie's study, uh, hmm. which had he not done that, we would know a lot less today. These Native Americans had all come together and had served together, and they adopted a new insignia, correct? Yes, yes, yes. Uh, so uh, most of the units in World War One, the divisions anyway, actually did not have insignia through the majority of the war. Um, hmm. They had, they had uh, collar pins and things of that nature. But this idea of a divisional kind of a crest or moniker uh, was a pretty late development. 
So the 36 really didn't get theirs until after the, the fighting was over and everything. But what they came up with was it's a uh, insignia on a, it's a khaki colored uh, letter T uh, over a blue arrowhead. And so mm. the T stands for Texas. The arrowhead represents Oklahoma. Um, and so, because that's where the 36 was formed from, it was formed from Eastern Oklahoma and uh, some adjacent parts of Texas. The 90th, on the other hand, the 90th division was Western Oklahoma and a lot of Western Texas. So it became the one with the T and the O, which Texas, Oklahoma, which got the nickname Tough Hombres. Oh, cool. uh, but for the 36th, it's the T with the, uh, the blue arrowhead and everything like that. And so it became known as the Arrowhead Division. Rightfully so. So the 36th Division was ordered home in April of 1919. As they set out for the U.S. on May 5th, their ship met severe head seas. Approximately 60 soldiers were thrown against the ship, and two men were killed and two wounded when they were swept aboard. What a journey. I mean, can you imagine they went through all this in the war and then they get killed on their way home? Terrible. Now, something interesting you talk about in the book and for which you did extensive research was determining who originated the idea to use Choctaw language for communications transmission. You mentioned that a little bit earlier. Who were all the people who claimed to have brought the idea of the Choctaw language in? Yeah, there's a whole, um, shall we say, series of either people asserting that such and such had the idea or of people actually claiming it. So one is Colonel Bloor, which is possible because, uh, like I say, he was the yeah. regimental commander and everything. Uh, another is uh, Major William Morrissey, who was the head of the Signal Battalion and um, uh, directly in charge of communications and things of that nature. Um, in the literature, there, there are several references to a Captain Lawrence in some of the newspaper articles and things of this nature. Uh, however, when the rosters are run, um, there is no Captain Lawrence um, hmm. that comes up in any of the units there and everything. And so, you know, it it's, can only speculate now, but did somebody mishear it? Did they just confuse the name, write the <laughs> wrong name down? Uh, right. Or, you know, possibly they meant Captain Horner and just, <laughs> just confused the name. It's hard to say. Um, there are others. Um, there's a gentleman named Lieutenant Mose uh, Belmard, which is a Kaw or a Kanza uh, native. And again, he's kind of like Walter Veach. He's older. He's been in the system for a while. And there are, um, there are claims sometimes and, and um, assignments of saying that he come up with the idea. I've never been able to find anything concrete on it, though, and everything. Um and then there are uh, references sometimes just through families, some newspapers, et cetera. Um, some of the code talkers themselves have claimed that they, uh, that they had the idea and everything of that nature. Um, it's, you know, to be, to be just uh, frank and honest, there really is no smoking gun here. Um, but um, Captain Horner's papers and, one of the things I was fortunate enough to do was come across some of his papers that his daughter had uh, that have not shown up in any archive anywhere in the country. There may be copies somewhere, but nobody's found them. And hmm. he's asked in 1942 to explain more detail about this idea, how he organized them, how he used them. And so there's a lot of, uh, a lot of detail in his letters there that, do not appear in any of the other documents, but he says the request came down uh, from uh, at least the battalion level. So somebody above there seems to have had the idea or picked up on the idea and then made the call requesting. So you've kind of given your opinion here and there about it could have been this guy. It could have been that guy. What, what is your personal opinion? If you had to choose someone that you think just for the Choctaw may have come up with the idea who do you think it would be? Well, you want to get me in a lot of trouble here. Yeah, I do. <laughs> so, <laughs> so controversial. I, again, um, probably the best source we have as far as a, a, a timed piece and a firsthand account is Captain Lawrence's, uh, or I'm sorry, um, uh, A.E. Horner's letter. And uh, it suggests that the call came from higher up. 
So I, I would have to, at this time, defer with that because it's really the only kind of concrete, dated information we've got, you know. Yeah. Oh, so interesting. I wish we could know. And like you said, it could have been a combination of things. It could have even been someone going, hey, I heard in this other unit over here they were using um, yeah. whatever other language, uh, whatever tribe to be able to use uh, for coding. So you never know. It and there are there are some some newspaper accounts um, of talking about people, you know, just hearing the natives visiting in their languages in the camps at night and things of that nature. So, you know, it, it's it's hard to say. Uh, maybe a certain officer picked up on that. I mean, they obviously knew they had a lot of natives in those units. They commanded them for months and months and everything. Right. So right. It, it, it was not a um, um, not an unknown source. But who and when they thought to use it as a resource, that's hard to say, you know. Yes. All right. Well, I won't hold your feet to the fire anymore on that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Dr. Meadows, thank you for joining me again, and we'll see you in Episode 3. Thanks for listening to Native Chalk Talk. Be sure to join our community on YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. And check us out at nativechalktalk.com. Stay tuned for the next episode. You're going to love it. Yako Ki. Thank you, my friends. <laughs>